Uh, so welcome to the second session of the One Click LCA, the One Click LCA Summer School. So the first session that we had yesterday was mostly the introduction, so the introduction to the summer school, um, but of course also uh, what we're actually going to be talking about, a bit about the software, some standards, legislation, etc. So there is still kind of the same rules. Uh, if you want to ask questions, please use the Zoom Q&A function. Um, yesterday we answered over 220 questions uh, using the Q&A function. So that was great. Um, I have a couple of moderators joining me today again, and this time it's Antti, Sean, and Samantha, who are all CS specialists in the CS team here. We'll make sure that the recordings are available the next day, and we'll try to see if we can make the slides available a bit earlier, but cannot make any promises on that, unfortunately. What we did yesterday was, first of all, the summer school overview. So what are we going to be talking about during these 14 sessions? We gave an introduction to who we are as One Click LCA. So who are we as a company? What kind of services do we offer? Uh, what is included to the One Click LCA platform? We talked a bit about climate change, uh, environmental impact of construction. Uh, for example, we mentioned there that uh, worldwide 39% of uh, global warming emissions are coming from construction. So those are the, those are the group of emissions we're trying to tackle, of course. Um, we talked a bit about legislation and some standards related to the environmental impacts around the world. And we talked a bit about the business case for sustainability. So why do we do this? There's, of course, the, the main one that we want to reduce the emissions, but there is a lot of uh, commercial options uh, for doing building sustainability, of course. We also have a LinkedIn user group. There were some requests yesterday if there could be a group where you guys from the summer school could, could communicate with each other. Um, so if you go to LinkedIn and you search for LCA Made Easy, you'll find it. So that is our user group. It already has a bit over 600 members. Uh, so feel free to join that and uh, we can let you in there and you can discuss uh, the summer school or maybe some questions you have about this uh, over there as well. So today on the agenda, we'll first of all be talking about the life cycle stage and how we can actually assess them. So we already covered a bit of life cycle stages yesterday because there were some questions about it. So I answered them during the Q&A session, uh, but we'll cover them a bit more in depth today. Then we'll look at different assessment methods and specifically the assessment methods we are using in one click LCA. And of course also impact indicators. So what kind of impact are we actually measuring? We'll talk about some core building LCA concepts and then we'll talk about the EPDs, program operators and our database structure. So the session today will be quite a lot about theory. Um, so there won't really be any software demos or anything like this, but that will be part tomorrow. So tomorrow will actually be the software training and we'll then also look at how we can actually use LCA or one-click LCA. Um, after the EPD and program operator and database structure part, uh, we'll also have a small homework part. And of course, uh, just like yesterday, we'll have the Q&A section. Um, so yeah. Let's try to see if we can put all this information I'm trying to put out there in the next one and a half hours, and then we can have a 30 minute Q&A session, give or take. We just see quickly how many people we have there now. That is a good amount. I'll slow this again. So when we are looking at the entire life cycle stage of what we can measure, um, we have a quite nice graph on this uh, available. And these are the sources of embodied carbon across the entire construction life cycle. So basically when we start with uh, the different type of life cycle stages, we have of course the raw material production. So any type of raw materials which are harvested, they are then transported as we can see here, which is A2, the transport to the manufacturing side. And then they are manufactured in a factory or anywhere else where the product is, is made ready. So those are the A1 to A3 steps. After that, we have A4. So this is the transportation of the final product. So this could be concrete or steel or wooden beams or anything like this uh, towards the construction site. Then we'll have A5, which is the installation and assembly of the materials into the building. Um, and then basically the building would be ready for occupation. And then we get to the use phase. So from an embodied carbon point of view, we have five stages there. We have the use phase. So this could be emissions regarding uh, refrigerants or general use of the building, then we can possibly have maintenance of the building or maintenance of the equipment in the building. We could have repair to materials, um, for example, repair to, to paints or anything like this or doors or windows. Then we have, of course, the replacement and the refurbishment of materials. So 
any materials which will have to be completely replaced like uh, interior fittings or paints or anything like this. Then there are two more life cycle stages which are not part of the embodied carbon, but the operational carbon. And those are of course the operational energy, which is B6, which we'll cover in a bit also. And then we also have B7, which is the operational water. So they are separate from the embodied carbon, but they are also quite important to the entire life cycle of our building. After the use phase, we basically get to the end of life. So the C1 is of course then the deconstruction and demolition of our building. So any emissions related to taking the building down or taking the materials out of the building. Then we have our C2, as we can see in the graph, which is the transportation of this waste. So that then goes to, for example, recycling facilities or landfills for disposal. When they do go to recycling facilities, we'll get C3 emissions, which are waste processing emissions. So basically if materials are made ready for recycling or they will be brought to plants for incineration. We'll have heat recovery for them. That is all related to C3. And then any materials we cannot recycle, which for, for example, don't have recycling values like uh, precast concrete might not be always recycled, might be landfilled. That goes to C4, which is basically disposal. So we have quite a lot of life cycle stages we can look at. So now let's take a look at which we are actually going to be looking at in the software right now and how we can also assess them in our software. So this slide I have shown yesterday as well. So the different life cycle stages for a normal uh, LCA, at least the A1 to A3 is always mandatory. And this is the cradle to gates. And this is also the minimum requirement for product LCA. So when we're doing a building LCA assessment and we're trying to find the right resources, we're usually getting EPDs, which I'll cover in a bit. And EPDs have to at least have the A1 to A3. So we have to have the raw material supply, the transport and the manufacturing of these materials. And then any of the other life cycle stages we can see here also, some of them are included with certifications, but not all. So it really depends what we're trying to calculate. And of course, outside of the A1 to C4, we also have the D phase, which are benefits and loans beyond the system boundary. These are usually represented on the result page of our software, but they're not always mandatory for certifications. When we have then a life cycle stage over a 60 year period, like in the example we had shown yesterday also, of course, most of the emissions we have are in the beginning at year zero. And this is of course, when our building is made. So we have those A1 to A3 materials, and these are usually aggregated. So we don't, when we do a building LCA, we don't necessarily look at A1, A2, and A3 separately. So A1 to A3 is the biggest group. Then we'll of course have the transportation of those materials, and then we have the construction. So all these emissions happen basically before occupation starts in the building. So before an office is, is used, before a factory gets used, et cetera. Then we have the use phase emissions. So any type of emissions which happen during that life cycle stage from year one to year 60, or can any be any period if we have, of course, a different period. And in this graph, we can see that a lot of it is energy because energy requirements are usually constant. But we can also see that at, for example, year 15, we have the first material replacement at year 20 again, year 25, year 30, year 40, et cetera. So kind of dependent on what kind of materials have to be replaced, there can be quite a lot of replacement emissions. And those of course are B4 and B5. So B4 is the replacement of the materials and B5 is the refurbishment. But from an LCA point of view, these are, are bundled together often. We can also see there is some B7 emissions, but it actually is so small that compared to the energy usage and the replacements, you cannot really see it. And then of course, at year 61, when the building is actually deconstructed, we also have those C1 to C4 emissions, which can also be separated in different type of uh, end of life. So we have actually C1, C2, C3, and C4, but in this graph, it, it doesn't show it that way. So which kind of life cycle stages are we going to measure? So we can do cradle to gate and cradle to gate is A1 to A3. And this is what we are having to do for product LCA. So when we are recording the emissions for an EPD, um, so that is the absolute mandatory there. We can also do cradle to grave. And in that case, we're looking at the A1 to C4, but usually they are of course split in the different life cycle phases. And for example, if we do a lead international assessment or lead in the US, we are usually looking at the cradle to grave assessment. 
we can also do cradle to cradle. And when we do cradle to cradle, we are also looking at the D phase. So we're looking also what is going to be done with the materials which come free after the demolition. So if we have materials which go to recycling, can we use them later? So can we reuse them? Can we recycle them? Can we repurpose them? We support in the software itself, all calculations of different types of life cycles. Um, most of them cradle to gate, but usually cradle to cradle is also possible. So we usually display also the D-phase emissions. So you can do with those whatever you want. The D-phase emissions are not always included in the totals, however. So as we see here also in the slide, most of the tools, the target certifications um, have their available life cycles restricted to meet exactly what is needed for those uh, requirements. So I have now three examples of result pages from our software. So the first one here we see is levels. So this is the European framework for levels where we do a full LCA. And when we do levels, there are some more indicators actually, which I'm not showing, but now I'm showing the major uh, impact assessment indicators. We can see for the life cycle stages, we have a quite broad scope. So we can look at the construction materials, the transportation of this construction site. There's different type of use phase emissions we can look at. And then of course, we also have the end of life and the D. We then have different type of indicators to look at because these are all within the, the level scope. It's in compliance with the EN 15978. So depending on what we're looking for with levels, we get a quite broad overview of everything. So we have different type of emissions and we'll cover also these different type of indicators you see here in a bit. When we, for example, look at LEED International or actually LEED US would be kind of the same. We have already a bit uh, more narrow scope. So we have, for example, the A1 to A3, we have the A4, A5 is not, ne not needed there, it's not mandatory. In this case, B1 and B2 are left out as well. What we have are B3 and our B4 and B5. We do have the end of life, but the D phase is not shown here. When we then take a look at the different indicators, they're also quite similar to, uh, to levels. But where levels has to follow the EN 15978, we follow the ISO 14040 here. So it's a slightly different uh, overview of how we have the emissions here. But we also have quite different type of tools which have a very restricted scope. So levels and lead, which I just showed, they are both lifecycle assessment tools. So we can do building LCA with those or we look at a broad range of different indicators and a broad range of lifecycle stages. The two examples I've shown here, they are tools which will also be actually, actually handled uh, in session 14, but they have a much more limited scope. So the first one here is for the Swedish Klima Declaration. So this is a carbon only scheme. So we only look at global warming potential. So on the result pages, you will actually have nothing else from an environmental point of view uh, to report on. And if we then check on the uh, results category, so what kind of life cycle stages are we looking at here? We have the construction materials, our A1 to A3. We have our transportation. Then we have site wastage. We have energy use on the site. And that is pretty much it. So we don't look at anything else across that. We then have the graph underneath there, which is the Finnish YM method. And they do it a bit differently. So we have, for example, different type of life cycle phases we look at, like the A1 to A5 is bundled. Um, we have the, the C phase available. And then there are also some table values, which basically give default values, which are only relevant for, for the Finnish scheme. We then also look at global warming potential, but in Finland, we don't look at the total of global warming potential. We look at the emissions per uh, square meter per year. So we can also see that the values, even though maybe the data used in these assessments would be quite similar, they display quite differently because we look at it in a different way. So this is a good example that depending on what type of uh, LCA or carbon study you're trying to do, the result pages usually only display what is needed for, for each of these schemes. So nothing else really. So when we look more into the different type of life cycle stages, um, day one to a three is then of course the product stage. This is pretty much mandatory in all cases. So any type of assessment you're trying to do, it will have a one to a three data. So it doesn't matter if it's lead, if it's any type of national scheme, or if it's for example, product LCA. So we have, of course, discussed this already, but just to show this again, 
A1 to A3 is always consisted of three stages, which are often uh, reported aggregated. In product LCA, they're not aggregated. They're always separate, but from a building LCA point of view, they are. So we have then the raw material extraction and supply, the transportation and the manufacturing, and they're always uh, recorded together. So how do we actually access it in one-click LCA? So the data for our A1 to A3 are usually based on our material quantities. So it could be that we have done a BIM model or a energy model, and these have quantities which we have uploaded to one-click LCA. Could be that we have uh, cost plans, Excel imports, anything like this. Or we could even take the values from 2D drawings, like architectural drawings. These we import. We then link these, of course, to EPDs or options from the database. And those values for the A1 to A3, they are usually sourced directly from the EPDs. So I'll cover also what EPDs are in a bit more, uh, in a bit, uh, a few slides in advance. So if we then have the A1 to A3, why I'm taking here the levels example, it's always the top uh, line. So we have there all the emissions for the A1 to A3 of all the uh, materials. This is usually one of the biggest groups of emissions. And of course, the energy use can also be quite big, not in this example, but normally if we do an assessment at least. Then the next stages are our construction process. So during the stage A4 and A5, we basically include any impacts and aspects related to any losses during the construction stage process. So this means the production, transport, waste processing and disposal of lost products and materials. A4 is always quite simple because we simply look at what are the quantities of materials which we are transporting from the factory where we are buying our products until where we are actually constructing our building. So then we have the A5 and the A5 includes all the emissions related to the installation and assembly of the building. So usually this could be quite high in energy cost or fuel cost by different type of machinery which are there. From uh, an LCA point of view, A4 and A5 are not mandatory for manufacturers to report on. So let's say we are buying some steel or concrete and the manufacturer gives us an EPD which has the data, it will usually miss A4, A5 data. It is not there because it's not mandatory to report on. So they're often calculated separately. So how do we calculate A4 and A5 in our software? It is thankfully quite easy. So A4, we always calculate based on default distances and modes of transport, which are always adjustable. So tomorrow throughout the uh, software training, I'll also talk about the LCA parameters. So when we set up a project in our software, at least a building project, you first have to set up the LCA parameters. And our LCA parameters are calculation rules, which will apply to the entire project. And I've also put an image to the help center here. If you search for selecting project parameters, it will, oh, you also find an article which explains this. So basically, if we start a project and we say, okay, we're going to be doing an office building in the UK or in Finland, or doesn't really matter where, we select a, a setting for our transportation. And this will give us already default modes of transportation and distances. So if we have concrete, it will tell us, okay, the concrete comes with a concrete mixer truck. Or if we have steel, this comes with a trailer combination. So a truck with a, um, a extra thing beneath it. Or if we have gravel, this comes with a dumper truck. And usually it comes uh, then, for example, 60 kilometers or 70 kilometers to building site. So that really depends on which setting we choose there. A5 is done a bit differently. So A5 is not something we can really find in EPDs either. In some cases, when we have materials which have hairy or which have very uh, uh, intensive emissions for, for the insulation phase, like certain insulations, there might be A5 data available there. But normally this is done either based on scenarios or inputting actual construction site data. So of course, when we're in really early phase, let's say we're still in the design phase and we already want to get an idea of what kind of construction site emissions we have, we can use a scenario. And these are usually based on square meter. So if you know that your building is 2,500 meters and we use a scenario, it will give us, okay, for example, per square meter, we estimate there is uh, two kilograms of emissions for waste. There is five uh, kilograms of emissions for fuel, energy, et cetera. Those kind of things will be available in the software. And I'll also cover that tomorrow. If we're in a late stage project, so maybe our project is already in, uh, in post-construction. 
so it has already been made, we usually have contractor information. So the contractors who have actually built the building or the uh, construction company, they will tell us, okay, we have used 20,000 liters of, of diesel. We have used uh, 20 kilo, 20,000 kilowatt hours of energy, all this kind of stuff. So you can then actually put all this information in accurately and you'll get a good overview of what the actual A5 emissions are. So A5 really depends on what stage of construction we are uh, and what kind of information we have available to us. A5 and A4, or A4 and A5 are always shown after the A1 to A3. So again, in this example from levels, we see that it's, it's right after. A5 can usually also be separated in different type of, of uh, groups. So we can, for example, look at the materials in A5. We can look at the construction site emissions to related to energy or the waste. So if we have filled in all that information, it's also expandable, but I'm not showing that right now, but I'll show it tomorrow uh, throughout the session. Then we get to the use phase emissions. So use stage um, emissions are not mandatory in most cases. So it really depends on what you're trying to calculate. There are some certification schemes which do ask you for this, and then you could maybe use a scenario or you could use your energy data from, uh, from building information models. But use phase can be quite difficult to estimate because for all the different life cycle stages you see here, not all have existing methodologies which allows you to really estimate them accurately, especially not in early phase when you don't have that much information available yet on, uh, on your building itself. So when we do uh, use phase emissions for B1, at least in one click LCA, this includes anything re regarding the user application of installed products. And when we can think of one of the biggest B1 use phase groups, this would be refrigerants. So if we have HVAC machinery uh, for, for heating and cooling of our buildings, this of course uses refrigerants and refrigerants can be quite polluting. So that is one of the biggest groups there. What we can also include for B1 is the concrete, uh, concrete carbonization. So if we have concrete, which is uh, exposed to air, it will absorb some uh, kind of carbon dioxide. And we can also record on vegetation carbon withdrawals. So if we decide that next to our building, we're going to be planting a bunch of trees, which will of course capture some carbon, we can actually also record that throughout the uh, B1 use phase. Then we have the B2 emissions. And um, B2 is a bit trickier because for B2 and B3, there isn't really any methodology uh, in regarding building LCA, which really allows you to accurately uh, report this. So B3 or B2 is usually reported kind of similar to A5, where we include separately all our emissions. So if we have emissions for maintenance, this is usually done on an annual rate. So maybe we know that uh, there is some cars driving every week to our premises. We could record the diesel use for these cars, or if we know that they are using X amount of energy for, re for, uh, for uh, maintaining things with maybe machinery to, to clean the floors or whatnot, those kind of things we can record, but no scenarios for those exist. So this would really be information that you would either have from your contractors or hours that machinery will be running, etc. B3 is usually uh, expressed in the form of a repair rate percentage. So if we have, let's say windows, there might be 1% of these windows which have to be repaired every year. But of course, repair rate also very much depends on a lot of different factors, like what kind of materials would have to be repaired, like structural materials are often not repaired. Um, also, what type of building we have, what is the use of the building, um, what kind of, of materials we have actually used, what is the quality of the materials, um, how experienced were the craftsmen who've installed these materials, so B3 can be quite tricky to also uh, report on because there's also, as I said, no methodology which allows you to accurately uh, record on these. Then we have, of course, our B4 and B5. So these are usually one of the biggest groups of use phase embodied carbon emissions. So embodied carbon emissions does not include B6 and B7 because that's the operational carbon. And usually B4 and B5 are either located in the software as just before emissions, where we are purely looking at the replacement of materials, but they are often also grouped, as I also said here. So then we have a B4, B5 together, which we can look at once. B4 and B5 then is usually calculated based on how long do we expect our building to last and how long will the materials in our building last. 
So if we know that the building is an office building, which will last 60 years, but the floor we have purchased from the manufacturer, the manufacturer says it usually lasts for 30 years, we'll have to replace that after 30 years. Then of course, we have the two uh, B use phase emissions for the uh, operational carbon, and that is energy and water. So energy can include anything relating to the operational usage of the building. So this could be the purchasing of grid electricity, this could be any fuels we use, um, any things we use for, for heating or other services. Um, but this, for example, can also uh, include uh, renewables we are, are uh, having in the building. So maybe we have PV panels on the roof, which will gather or, or generate some electricity, which we don't have to use them for, uh, or we don't have to purchase from the grid. So that then actually will be allocated to D phase, which I'll come back to in a bit. B7, and of course, up, uh, includes the operational water use. So any amount of water we are using to keep the building running. And in Norway, we actually also have B8, which is an operational transport, which can also be a massive part of emissions if you have a lot of people working in an office. But these are the most commonly used use days emissions. So how do we report these in one click LCA? So as I just said also, most of our calculation tools, they only do B4 and B, or B4, B5. So they don't really report on any of the others. B1 is one of those phases, which is to my current knowledge, not mandatory in any calculation tool. But for example, in the UK, when we do GLA, they sometimes do ask for it. We have B2, which is currently only available in our UK based tools because it's a requirement for the GLA and RICS. And in those cases, it's always based on user input because there is no way to have a scenario for it because there just hasn't been enough research done on this topic. B3 is then usually done with the repair rate. And I'll show you this tomorrow uh, during the training also. And this is usually something you have to input yourself. So when we do B3, you have to think of the fact that um, structural materials like the, the steel, the concrete, they will not be repaired usually. They will just be left alone for the 60 years. Um, and usually these are all, of course, also not replaced. So repair rate would be really materials which do not last as long as the building in most cases. So this could be the, uh, the facade, the finishes, the fittings, these kind of things. Then B4 and B5, they are calculated with the service life settings. And then also, of course, with the asset calculation period. So if we have an office building, which will last 60 years, but we have floors which will be replaced after 30 years based on what we have set there. Um, then of course leads to replacement emissions or refurbishment emissions. It does not really matter if you do not know what the service life of your, your materials are going to be because we also have default settings for that. So if you have uh, a project and you set up the first LCA parameters, it will ask you what kind of service life setting you want to use. And usually we have them, for example, the options of, of the technical service life, which is the most common service life setting, or we can, for example, have commercial service life. And in commercial type buildings, materials usually do not last as long. So the floors or the finishes, they will usually have to be replaced more often. B6 and B7 are pretty much always based on user input or consumption quantities. So this could be that you have done energy modeling with IES, EDA eyes, or anything like this. And you get from those already consumption uh, stats. Uh, for example, in Finland, if a building is made, they also make an energy certificate, which also uh, outputs the, uh, the uh, annual consumption. So you could use that for B6. For B7, there are some tools which exist, which allows you to calculate water, um, but usually these are also based on, on consumption stats, maybe in post-construction. Um, I think I missed there one, oh no, there it is. Don't mind the heading, it's supposed to say use phase results. But as we can see in the uh, example here, we have there the use phase, the repair rate, material replacement and refurbishment, and then we have energy and water. So the use phase then is expandable. We can also have uh, the concrete carbonization, the refrigerants and the vegetation carbon withdrawals, the repair rate, rep uh, depends on if we have repair rate for initial materials and then materials which might have to be replaced and repaired. And then of course, in our uh, material replacements, we are also looking at um, just a material replacement, but also 
the transportation of these materials which will be replaced and also the additional waste which will be generated. So then we get to the end of life stage. So these are all emissions which happen after and during the building or asset demolition. So once the building has been deemed unfit for use anymore, maybe not structurally safe or has to make room for a different type of, uh, of uh, uh, planning, then the building will be deconstructed. So the emissions of these stages depends a lot about how materials are actually handled. And it can be quite tricky to say how this will happen because this is usually a period 60 years from now. So if we're doing this assessment, we are kind of making an estimation of what is going to be our end of life. But if it's actually going to be like this, it can be quite difficult. So EPD uh, data doesn't usually have uh, C4 to C or C1 to C4. It's not mandatory currently. And I also note there that more on that later, because we there are some changes coming to the current uh, standards and more specifically to the EN 15804. So in building LCA, I'll come to this also in a bit, uh, under A2, C1 to C4 will become mandatory. But if we take a look at the different stages, C1 includes all the emissions related to demolition and deconstruction. And of course, currently, if you're going to a building site or you're in the city and you see some building which is deconstructed, um, you see a lot of machinery which usually runs on, on diesel or fuel oils or whatnot. So 60 years from now, probably those will be electric. So also the C1 data we have right now might not be accurate for what happens in 60 years. But still electric vehicles for demolition are not that common. We see them sometimes in the Nordics, but anywhere else it probably doesn't really happen yet. Then we have the emissions for the transport. So once the building has been torn down and we have stripped all the materials out of the building, uh, the materials have to be transported. So the materials which can be useful, so it can be recycled or reprocessed, they will go to waste reprocessing facilities or centers, or they might actually go to the disposal. So depending on where they go, they could go to two different ways. And these are usually transported with, uh, with dumper trucks, of course. Then C3 are any emissions which include waste processing. So if we have aluminum, which goes to waste processing facility, which will be recycled there, uh, steels, organic materials like CLT or wood, timber, these kind of things, they usually go to uh, plants where we get, uh, they, they get incinerated. In Europe, same goes for plastic waste. And there we, of course, get heat recovery. So the benefits from these, they will be assigned to D, more on that in a bit. Any materials we cannot recycle, they will go to waste disposal. So there are certain insulation materials which are just not recyclable, or at least not when they have been torn out of the building just like that. So they're landfilled. If we have, for example, concrete, if we have ready mixed concrete, this is usually turned into aggregate. So this is waste which is processed. But if we have precast concrete blocks, these can also be landfilled. So then we have the C4 emissions, which just means that they are dumped in a site and there's earth thrown on top of them. So how do we assess end of life in one click LCA? So end of life is a bit tricky or tricky under the current uh, EN 15804 A1 standard because manufacturers don't have to report on it. So for that reason, we have three ways of reporting end of life. So two of them are based on scenarios. And a third one is based on if the EPD, so if the manufacturer has set in their EPD, if there are end of life emissions. So C1 data can be included with a grouped scenario. And the grouped scenario is true for all of these end of life stages. So the first option for assessing end of life would be that we simply have one value, C1 to C4, which include everything. But C1 can also be done with a demolition scenario. And a demolition scenario is then in that case based on square meter of your, of your building. So there have been some studies done in the UK on demolition for C1. So if you fill in, for example, I have a building for 2,500 square meters, it will automatically give you a value for, uh, for the deconstruction, which is based on actually deconstructed project, projects. Oh, my bad. So then we have C2 and C4, or C2, C3, and C4. So in that first scenario where we have the group scenario, as I said, it's just one value. But C2, C3, and C4 can be directly linked to the materials. So we can also see here, I've stated that all of these emission uh, stages, 
we can calculate them based on the project material mass and the chosen end of life scenario. If we have C2, it basically decides are the masses of materials we're taking from this building going either to a recycling facility or are they going to a landfill? When we take a look at C3, we are only taking the materials which will be processed for recycling. So if there's any materials we can recycle, we'll calculate basically what kind of emissions we have for cleaning them, processing, making sure they can be reused as materials again, or can be processed and cleaned for uh, incineration, for example. C4, then we just calculate the emissions for disposing of this, uh, this, this materials. So C4 is usually lower in emissions than C3, but C4 does not bring any benefits really. So in C3, we can of course recycle materials, which is good from a circularity point of view. And C4 is kind of a destructive uh, action. We also do not really include C4 in, uh, or the, there is no benefits from C4, which are, are uh, shown from a circularity point of view. But I'll come to that uh, tomorrow when we do the circularity training also. So as I said, also the end of life stages are present in most of our calculation tools. As you remember, it was not uh, in, for example, the Swedish one in Klima Declaration, they don't look at that. And it very much depends on the end of life method you choose. So if you're in our one click LCA help center and you search for end of life scenarios, you'll find the article which I linked here, end of life scenarios for construction projects. So if you check that article, it will tell you exactly what end of life scenarios are available in the software and basically what you end up with if you choose them. So we can see in BC1 to C4 results in one click LCA that they're usually separated uh, by the different life cycle stages. So if we have chosen that first option, the material locked, you'll just have one value. So you only have C1 to C4. But if we're doing one of the more advanced end of life scenarios, we'll have separated end of life stages. So in the example here, C1, the deconstruction or demolition scenario is empty because I hadn't entered it. So in those cases, C1, we can only do with that scenario. But any of the others, the C2, the C3 and C4, they are of course based on the transported material mass or the process material mass. So that can be linked directly to our materials. So you can calculate that quite, uh, quite accurately. The end of life in our, in our software is done of course based on the transported mass, but then for the end of life processes, we have modeled these uh, using echo and event data. Then we have the D phase. So these are the benefits and load beyond the system boundary. D phase is usually not mandatory for schemes. And when it is actually reported in projects, it's usually more as like extra information. So people are free to take this into account themselves. So if they want to include it to their totals, they can, but from a certification point of view, it's not always needed. So these include any benefits to the building. So re reuse of materials, recovery of materials, recycling potentials, and uh, module D basically allows us to consider what happens with the materials after the, the current life cycle of our building. And that's considered with the cradle to cradle approach. So how do we assess this in one click LCA? So as I said, these are usually external impacts. So they're not calculated towards the final certification score, but they're usually displayed on the bottom of the results page. And they are usually based on the materials and the end of life process, which is, which is chosen, of course. So as we can see here, the D phase, if we expand it in our software, we can have a negative value from, for this because these are benefits to the building. So they are positive emissions. We can have emissions relating to the installed materials. So these would be emissions for anything which will be reused, recycled, anything like this. If we have materials which are coming from the construction site, which can be recycled, that can be a separate one. If there is waste from the construction site, which can we can recycle, it's separate. Any materials which will be repaired, and maybe some of this uh, repaired material, which will be waste, can potentially also be recycled. As you can see, nothing in my example here. But then any materials which are replaced, we can also recycle. So for this example, I probably haven't replaced any materials which are worth replacing. Um, so probably haven't replaced any organic materials or something like this or uh, steels or these kind of things. And then we also have that D2. And D2 is the exported energy. So if we have a building 
where in our energy use phase, we are purchasing grid electricity, but we also have some PV panels and our PV panels generate electricity. These are not added to the energy use because of course, renewable energy is not a, a positive score, so to say. So that will be always attributed to exported energy. And this can, can of course be used to lower the purchased electricity uh, or re replace uh, some of the electricity we're supposed to be purchasing, but it could also be uh, exported. Like we can deliver that somewhere else as well. Then now we'll take a look at the different type of assessment methods and impact indicators uh, we have in the software. So when we look at different type of uh, impact indicators and assessment methods, there's often quite a lot of different type of terminology there. So when we are doing an assessment using our software for LEED, REAM, any type of certification, um, we are using data which is already characterized. Some of you might be familiar with EPD data or Equivent data or Gabi data. So when a manufacturer has to make uh, an assessment of their product, they do an LCA for that, product LCA, and they usually use LCI data. So lifecycle inventory data. So in lifecycle inventory data, we have all the raw emission data, so to say. So the data regarding to the harvesting of, of the resources for, for their final product, uh, the transport of this, and then of course also the manufacturing. So this LCI data doesn't really, it will have an emission value, but it cannot be used right away for just building LCA. So if you're doing building LCA, you cannot, for example, just use straight echo infant data because it's not characterized. So we have to characterize it according to an LCIA method, which is a life cycle impact assessment. There are multiple different type of LCA methods, so different type of characterization methods, but we are using in our software basically, basically two or the two most, most used ones. And that is in this case, either CML or Tracy. If you want to know a bit more about the difference between LCA, LCI and LCIA and EPD data, you can also go to our help center and search for this specific article that I linked here. It will also explain basically what I'm going to be covering now. So the two majorly used uh, characterization methods are CML and Tracy. So CML was developed in 2001 by the University of Leiden in Netherlands, and it's mainly used in Europe but it actually sees adoption all over the world. And as you see, CML stands for Centrum for Milieuwetenschappen in Leiden, which is the Center of Environmental Sciences in Leiden. Tracy was developed by the US Environmental Protection Agency. So that's a US government agency. And the Tracy methodology for the characterization of the data is mainly used in North America. So we can see that Tracy here stands for the tool for re or reduction on assessment of chemical and other environmental impacts. If you go to the help center article you see here, impact assessment categories, you'll also find uh, uh, this basically explained. The differences also between CML and Tracy. So when we look at the main indicators we have in the software, these are for CML, of course, global warming potential. And global warming potential and CML and Tracy are pretty much the same. And for that reason, this reason, we, for example, also have in our software uh, one tool, it's called Global Carbon, and it actually allows both CML and Tracy data to be used because the unit of measurement for these is pretty much the same. We have also ozone depletion potential, still quite the same in both of them. And then we have the acidification potential. So acidification potential is kind of calculated the same way in CML and Tracy, but the units of measurements are a little bit different. And after that, all the units of measurements will be different. So the eutrophication potential, same kind of indicator in both CML and Tracy, but the units of measurements, so how it's calculated is basically the same. Same for photochemical ozone creation. It is pretty much the same, but it's just called different. So we have POCP and CML and smog formation in, uh, in Tracy. Also the units are different. Then we have the last one, which is the abiotic depletion of potential uh, fossil fuels, so fossil fuel depletion. And this is calculated kind of similar way in CML and Tracy. So if you see these two different type of characterization methods, CML and Tracy, we can also see why if we have an EPD of a concrete product, which has been calculated according to CML, 
we just cannot use it in North America because they have to calculate it in different ways. And the same way, if we have a product from, from the US, which is only be recorded against, uh, according to Tracy, we cannot use it in Europe because it just doesn't match what we're trying to calculate. So I'll also give you some examples about, about that later. So what are we actually measuring with these indicators? That is, of course, always a very good question. You can read this a bit later, but basically there will just be some uh, recaps of what these different indicators are. So global warming potential is something pretty much everybody knows, quite similar or quite, uh, quite well known. Ozone depletion potential is of course the depletion of ozone. So just read this back later if you want to know about this. Acidification is the acidification of, uh, of soil and water around the world due to pollutants, which turn it into acids. We have eutrophication, which is the enrichment of nutrients. So this is usually aquatic or terrestrial. Then we have the photochemical ozone creation potential. And then we have, of course, the abiotic depletion potential. So the depletion of fossil fuels, which we cannot do forever. There are different type of indicators also, but not all of these are relevant for the type of LCA we're going to be doing. So in the US, we have some additional TRACY indicators, but for example, in our LEAD US tool, these are not mandatory uh, indicators. So you only have those indicators, which are called earlier. We have there human health cancer, human health non-cancer, human health criteria pollutants and ecotoxicity. So these can be calculated with some data sets, but as they are not mandatory, not all EPDs even have data on these indicators either, even though they are trace indicators. We also have other CML indicators or other EN15804A1 indicators. And in this case, there is an 18 additional indicators on top of those six, which I had already covered. Most of these will not be present in the calculation tools, but for example, the levels tool, which will also be included with the, uh, with the training license, it will actually also have, uh, have some of these indicators, which are, for example, related to energy or these kind of things. Then we also have biogenic carbon. And biogenic carbon is a bit of a tricky subject. So biogenic carbon is the carbon that is stored in biological materials, so in, in plants or soil, from an EP, EPD point of view, basically in any materials which have biological makeup. So CLT, uh, wood fiber boards, these kind of things. So when we have plants which grow, they accumulate carbon. Um, so in theory, that means that any bio-based products we are using, they can contribute to reduce the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So they are basically good from an environmental point of view. And biogenic carbon within a building can be considered as a negative emission um, because it, it stores carbon, of course. If we burn the biomass after, uh, after the building is deconstructed, so let's say we have a wooden building we have built, and after 60 years we're burning it, then of course the carbon will be released back into the, in the, uh, in the atmosphere. But if we use the most, uh, mostly used LCA methodologies like CML and TRACY. Uh, we cannot include this uh, in the current global warming uh, results as the material is usually considered to, to grow back in the decades, which are after that, uh, if the area of the forest does not change as it says here. In one click LCA, we have two methods for this. And these methods are both only applying really to the current EN 15804A1 standard. So, the first one, which is the most common one, and pretty much all of our calculation tools use this, is that the biogenic carbon is only stored as additional information. So on the result page, which, which I will highlight in a bit, you'll see that there is a section for biogenic carbon. And that basically means that there are no negative emissions of storing the CO2 uh, uh, from the atmosphere in, in A1. And the releasing of it when we're actually burning the wood for energy recovery, are not included either. So it's really a separate section. There are two calculation tools or methodologies we do it differently. And that is the DGMB, which is the German uh, building certification scheme and energy carbon, and probably also RE2020, which are the French tools. 
In those cases, all the biogenic, biogenic carbon, which is sort of over the lifetime, is already included in the global warming results. And the negative emissions um, are basically shown there. So that means if you have an EPD, it can actually have negative emissions. So positive because the effects of uh, biogenic carbon are included there. And then of course, when we are looking at the end of life phases, so when we are recycling the organic materials in C3, that stored carbon is then added back into the atmosphere. Biogenic carbon is quite a hot topic right now in a lot of different countries, because a lot of certifications are not including this in how they are currently looking at the calculations. So for example, in the Netherlands, there's a really big uh, discussion ongoing right now that they want materials which have biogenic content to be rated differently from materials that don't, because in theory, it's better to use these kind of materials. So that will probably be a bit bigger, but in the EN 15804A2, this will be handled slightly different. So how do we assess this in one-click LCA? So the method I discussed first, the number one, which is the most commonly used, is that it's just reported as stored. So in this case, when we look at the biogenic carbon stored here, we just have one value. It just happens to be on the same line as the A1 to A3, but it doesn't really matter that it's like it doesn't mean that it's actually there. It's just uh, the total stored uh, biogenic carbon. As we see, there's also some use phase emissions. So this could be the vegetation carbon withdrawals. So if we plant trees on the premises of our office building, uh, these would of course also store some biogenic carbon. So with this method, it's also not reduced in C1 to, or not removed in C1 to C4. So it's basically up to yourself to do something with this information. It's not used uh, in, in getting credits or anything like this. So there are some changes coming to the impact assessment, uh, at least in the, in the EN standard. So when we have the current EN 15804 standard, we have the uh, A1 amendment. So we can see in the little uh, picture we have here, in 2012, EN 15804 was started. In 2013, there was a revision, which was the A1. And now we have a revision that came out uh, in 2019, which will be uh, start to become mandatory in July 2022. And this revision to the EN standard, it will, of course, have a huge effect on building LCA also, because the emissions of products will have to be recorded differently. And at the moment, it doesn't affect too much yet because it's not mandatory yet. And most of the current building LCA schemes, they still use the, the A1 uh, version of 15804. But for manufacturers, this will have to change because they will have to report uh, the emissions of their materials in a different way. There is two links here, which you can check out later. And the first one is one link from our help center, which is the difference between uh, both of these and how we basically record these emissions. And then there's also a second one, which has been kind of written uh, for, for manufacturers. So what has changed in A2 and what can you do to prepare for it basically? So in short, the difference between these is if we take a look at the 15804A1, so what we are currently using to assess buildings with, we have already those impact categories and the units which are, are familiar to us. So of course, the global warming potential, ozone depletion, acidification, eutrophication, and photochemical ozone uh, creation potential. If we then look at the A2 standards, so this will be the new one, which will replace A1 at some point. Global warming potential is there split in three separate categories. We have the normal fossil, which kind of equates to the global warming potential you see up there. It's not exactly the same, but it gets quite close. Then we have biogenic separate. So basically that whole discussion about how do we record biogenic, kind of becomes uh, invalidated when A2 lances, launches because it will be there as a separate indicator. Then we have a third indicator for global warming potential, which is LULUC, which stands for land use and land use change. This is something which is currently already recorded, for example, in Norway, where if they are changing the land area where they're going to be building, so maybe they're changing it from, from marsh or from forest to like normal construction, that of course has influence on, on the land uh, which you use. So that is calculated there also. Ozone depletion potential stays quite the same, but it's not calculated the same way. So even though we see that the unit of measurement 
looks the same. It's not calculated the same way. Acidification, we can also see the indicator is different. So we have the acidification potential here in kilograms of SOT equivalent. And here it becomes this mol H plus. Eutrophication, we had one indicator under the 15804A1, which will be split into three separate ones. So we'll have the eutrophication potential of terrestrial, of marine, so seawater, and of freshwater, so lakes, rivers, these kind of things. Then we have the photochemical ozone depletion or ozone, ozone creation potential, my bad. And the unit of measurement there also becomes different. So we see it's not, not the same anymore. So these kind of changes are coming in the future, not quite there yet, but for example, in product LCA calculations on our platform also, you can already uh, calculate according to A2. So for example, if we have clients who are doing EPDs for their products, we also always recommend them uh, to release both of them. So they release a set of A1 data, which basically ensures that the products they are creating now, our clients can still calculate with them. And we have, all, of course, also the A2. So they're also ready for the future. Then we have a few core building LCA concepts, and then we'll split to the uh, EPD program operator and database structure. When we do a building LCA, we can kind of simplify this down to just five steps. So first of all, we have to decide what are we calculating? So what is the type of our building? For example, an office, what would be life cycle we're looking at? Most commonly 60 years, and we might need geometry information, but that is not as, as relevant in this case. Then of course, we collect the material information. This seems very straightforward, but the material information can be a very time consuming process depending on what kind of information you have. If you would have just architectural drawings, getting all the data from these architectural drawings into a form of that is possible for LCA could take like one or two weeks or three weeks, depending on how much experience we ha you have with this, of course. But we can also do this with imports. So if we have the models, energy models, cost plans, if we have carbon designer or know how to make constructions or groups of, of materials, we can import this type of data also. And that can really cut down the amount of time we need uh, to do or to gather this material information. We then also can add, for example, energy use, water use, construction site data, kind of depending on what the scope is of our assessment. And there we can, of course, also add, for example, the repair rate or material waste percentage, anything like this. So if we have collected the material information, we have imported all the details for our building, we have added the energy and water, we get a value. Then we have our results. And then if we are doing lead, we have to maybe do optioneering to get a reduction on our results. Or if we're doing BREAM, of course, we are just doing carbon reporting. So whatever we report will be just used for, for the results uh, report. Then of all this data, when we, for example, have our, our building, we have to, of course, also fill in the uh, gross internal floor area. Because usually when we do the reporting, we do look at the total numbers. So let's say we have, uh, 2 million uh, kilogram equivalent of emissions, but usually we also look at the emissions per square meter. And this is usually done by gross internal floor area. Later, if you check the uh, PowerPoint, you can also click on that and it actually brings you to the definition from, uh, from RICS and IPMS, which we have used. We also have there the option for energy from a simplified energy model or a SAP rating if you have data for energy on those. Then what kind of data are we actually gathering for a building? So of course, the material collection is a very important phase, uh, but what kind of data do we want to collect? Very much depends, of course, on, on what kind of project we're doing. And it might actually influence if you actually take a project or not. If we're doing something from energy tools, we usually have the thermal envelope only. We might already have the energy use for the operational phase, the annual energy use. So that can be quite good because it provides us with a large group of useful information. If we're in different stages of the project, we might have access to design tools. So we could have a model from Revit, Tecla, Archicad, or anything like this. And depending on the stage of your design, they could have a variety of useful information. So in really use phase, 
you might not be able to use them really, but in late stage or post-construction, these design or these BIM models usually have so much information that you only have to upload the data to our platform, make the choices from the database, and that's pretty much it. Cost plans are also very common, and they're usually in early phase stages where, for example, the cost plan has been made, and we know that we are getting concrete, we know that we're getting steel, cement, etc. But we don't yet know what kind of manufacturers we're pursuing or exactly what type of uh, concrete specifications. If we are then in completely different stages where we only have 2D drawings or sketches, we probably will need a lot more information to be used. Like if we have just 70 PDFs of 2D drawings and we have to do an LCA on that, uh, you can probably set aside like a month to do your LCA. So the more information you have available, the easier you can do your, your assessment basically. What kind of data we actually need for the assessment, and this will also be the next chapter in this session, uh, kind of depends on what we're looking at. So if we're doing this for a certification point of view, we usually want to have EPDs. So these have to be either manufacturer specific or generic type three EPDs. And of course it is most effective and, and best for the product project if we know uh, what kind of products we are actually pursuing. So these are EPDs in line with the EN standard then. We can also have generic materials. So these could be actually calculated to be in line with the EN standard also, but they might not be third party verified, for example. There are some options like the impact database in the, in the UK, which you have to use for certain BREAM assessments. Then we have the Dutch NMD database, which consists of EPDs, but also generic data. And we also have our own generic data, which we in this case model with, with EquiInvent. There are, of course, other types of data uh, available, like generic LCA sources, uh, like the ICE database in the UK, which can be used for comparative carbon studies. But for example, the quality of the data, because it's generic, you're not allowed to use it for, for Brayon purposes. So it kind of depends on what kind of data we're, we're looking at here. When we are doing different type of designs and we are looking at different type of stages, we should also look at what kind of data is most relevant for us to use at these points. If we're really early in the concept stage design, we, for example, could have access to EquiInvent data, uh, which is uncharacterized, where you have generic uh, steel option for entire European Union. So that kind of data would be very, very early stage. It represents such a large scope of construction that it probably would not be so accurate. If we're in a bit later stage, maybe we already know that instead of steel, we're going to be looking for steel for upper floor construction. We could, for example, use Carbon Designer. There we also have generic data, but it's already characterized. So we could already have some idea what these emissions are, or we could, for example, use the impact database uh, from the UK uh, if we're doing UK studies, of course. If we're down a bit further, so maybe we're between concept stage and detail stage design, we could already know what type of profiles we're looking for. So instead of we know that we are looking for steel for upper floor, we are looking for specific structural steel profiles, maybe like I profiles, H profiles, these kind of things. And then there are different types of generic data which are specifically made to meet these profiles. If we're then even further, so in detail stage design where we usually already have quite a lot of information, um, then we could know that instead of these profile steel, we're looking specifically at steel, shape, uh, steel l shaped channels, and we could have, for example, a selection of manufacturers we could choose from. For example, one of the products mentioned here is some specific EPD for, uh, for, for L-shaped channels from Celsa Steel uh, in the UK. And if we then want to do really, really accurate stuff, we could, of course, also ask the manufacturer for specific data on their products. So maybe we have some custom steel which will be slightly deviating from what they reported in their EPD, a manufacturer could give us a declaration, which we can then use for, for our, our uh, studies. So it very much depends on what stage of the project we are and what kind of information we have available there and, and what we're going to be using. Then now we'll take a look at EPD, program operators and our database structure. And then after that, we have the, the homework assignment. So, what is an EPD? An EPD is basically an externally verified standardized description of 
any type of material or narrow down an environmental profile of a material or product over its entire life cycle. Usually EPDs um, help with, with transparency communication because the manufacturer tells what the emissions for their products are and it allows everybody to use the emissions of this product uh, to get an overview for cradle, of, uh, cradle to grave impacts. There's also a link which I posted here on clickelsia.com slash EPD hub, which also has an EPD one pager and also some information uh, for, for manufacturers if they are interested in making EPDs. So I recommend to check that out as well. EPDs can be based on different types of standards. So we have the basic standards from the US, the ISO uh, 14040 and 1444. And then of course we have the European standards, the EN 15804, which are currently in the 15804 A1. And next year upcoming is the 15804 A2. EPDs have to be created and verified in according with the ISO standards. And there are also some uh, product, categorization, product category rules, my bad, PCR uh, for EPDs in, in Europe. And EPDs can really help you achieve EPD and LCA credits and certification schemes because a lot of these schemes like, um, for example, in BRAM or LEED, you can actually get points for using products which are covered by EPDs. So that can be very useful. There are different types of EPDs we can do. So the most common is, uh, is the, the cradle to gate. So then we include just the manufacturer process, which includes the harvesting of the materials, the transportation of the materials, and of course, the manufacturing of the materials. It has quite basic data, but it's already enough uh, for us to have in the software because the other life cycle stages, we can either use scenarios for, or we can do it based on the mass of the data. It can also be broader. So we can also have cradle to, gra to grave. And this is something we see sometimes, but not always because it's not mandatory currently in EPTs. So this would include much more, but usually cradle to grave includes the A1 to A3 and then C1 to C4. In some EPDs, it could also cover use phase or installation phase, but very much depends on the EPD. And since it's not mandatory, this type of data is usually not taken from the EPD. Because if you have 200 EPDs and one of them reports on those phases, but the rest don't, then it can really put the one EPD in kind of a bad light if the other EPDs look more sustainable, even though they just haven't reported on those stages because they haven't, uh, they didn't have to. We can then also have cradle to gate. And then we can also have different type of D phase options, which are there. So that could be that we have different type of recycling processes. Uh, we have the, like materials could be reused, recycled or repurposed or anything like this. Now I'll show you an example of an EPD. There will be two examples which will be downloadable later of EPDs which have been made with our software. Um, we can also see the EPD numbers here, the RTS 7720 and 132.1. If you already have access to the software, you can check them now already, but other, otherwise you could also check them uh, tomorrow. So let's go over one of these EPDs. I'll just have to stop this presentation right now and I'll grab one of them. So we have one EPD here. Let me see if I can make this bigger. Uh, hide. Um, yeah, my settings are unfortunately in Finnish. Okay, but doesn't really matter. So EPDs we have in our database, uh, the language of the EPDs usually depend on where the manufacturer is located. So most of the EPDs are only available in their original language. Doesn't really matter because all the EPDs have to follow the same standards. So we can, for example, see that on this EPD, it's made in accordance with the EN 15804A2, but also with the ISO 14025 and ISO 21930. Then usually the front page talks about what kind of product we're looking at. So we can see here, we have a precast concrete wall made by OUTMB Elements, which is the manufacturer name. And we can see it's published on RTS, which is this little program operator logo here. And we can see that it's actually made with our software. So one of our clients has recorded the emissions for this product. On the second part of the information, you usually have general information about the product, the manufacturer, any type of standards which might be relevant. And this can also be in the original language. So we can see that for this one, it's a manufacturer from Estonia. Maybe I'll make this a little bit bigger. 
we can see they have a specific uh, product name. They just have one place of production. And we can also see where it has been published. So on the Finnish RTS scheme, we can see that the EPD has been made in accordance with certain standards. So in this case, the A2, we can see that some product category rules apply also. And we can see who has made the EPD also. This one has been externally verified, which is required according to the ISO 14025. And I can actually see that the verifier here was our CEO, Panu. So he will actually be doing the session on Friday with you guys. We have here the EPD number. So if you would go to the program operator of this, uh, this EPD, you can see here, sir, was rts.fi. If you type in the EPD number, or you just type in this number in our uh, website or in our, uh, in our uh, platform, my bad, you can actually already see uh, the emissions for this product. We can also see it has been verified and signed. Then there is some information on the product information. So what kind of product are we actually looking at? So we can see it's a precast concrete wall, certain type of, of uh, concrete, C30, C37. And we can see that there is already a V-bar. That is quite common for, for precast products. There are also some studies done for the different thicknesses which have been calculated here. And there are some other standards which relate really just to this type of product. Oh, then the next page we have product material composition. So this concrete, precast concrete wall, we can see it's made of limestone, sand, granite, etc. We have a different type of mass. We usually talk about where the products are from and if there are any problems with uh, different type of substance which are included as well. Then usually the manufacturer talks a bit about the product life cycle. So how is it manufactured? How is it transported? Is there any emissions for the use phase or anything like this? And we can also see the manufacturer process here. So it starts with cleaning some mold for concrete. We add the formwork and the rebar. We add the concrete, finishing, we cure the concrete, remove the formwork, we finish it. And then basically the product is ready for transportation to the building site. So not all manufacturers put the information this specific there, but usually it's a variation of what is available here. Then we have, of course, the life cycle assessments. So what are we actually calculating? This specific product here, we can see that declared units was one ton, so 1,000 kilos. And we can also see that from the different life cycle stages here, that this one has recorded A1 to A3, also the transportation. And then we actually also have some of the end of life emissions. So we have C1, C2, C3, and C4. And then we have the recovery or recycling, depending on what they're going to be using it for. If there's any biogenic content, they usually state it. And usually they also talk about the system boundary. So what has actually been calculated. So it's similar to that graph you see there as well. Again, we have here the system boundary. So we have the raw material extraction, the transportation of these raw materials, the manufacturing. Then there's probably some waste which also happened here. So we can see that it's transported and brought to a waste treatment. We then have transportation, but then we don't have any use phase or insulation emissions. Precast concrete usually does not have that much insulation emissions except perhaps by machinery, which has to um, tow it into place. And then we have demolition emissions, transport, and then either waste treatment or disposal. So there's actually two different type of uh, end of life processes there uh, done. There's some information about cutoff criteria. If there's perhaps data not included, or if there is some allocation estimation or assumptions made with this specific EPD, and then it talks about, about those a bit also. Manufacturers usually also have to make a background report, which has probably about 30, 40 pages of information just regarding this also, but this is left out of a normal EPD. We then have the data itself. So in this case, the manufacturer has chosen to report A2 data. So they are basically already ready for the new iteration of the EN standard. So 15.804 A2. We can see that they have reported the data per lifecycle stage also for A1 to A3. So we have the total climate change. So that's global warming potential, but also the different ones there, but also the aggregated values. So the aggregated values is usually what is used. Transportation, if we want to use those, no A5 and no use phase. And then, of course, we have different type of end of life data. 
There's some optional additional uh, data here. So these are data we don't necessarily have to use, but we can see here, for example, we have the cancer and non-cancer effects, which are also from the Tracy indicators. So just from a normal LCA, this would have been okay, but they add additional information uh, extra. They, in this case, also add natural resources. So the amount of emissions coming from the use of them, specific end of life waste data, and also different output flows. So how much of this material could be reused, how much of the material would be recycled, can be used for energy recovery, etc. Then there is some extra information regarding the weight of the products, which have been added here. And then there's usually a lot of information about different types of scenarios, bibliography, so what kind of data have they actually used to make this, and then some information about the manufacturer itself. Then in the appendix here, they have also added the A1 data. And this is quite important right now and will probably still be quite important next year also, because if we have that A1 data, it means that the CPD can still be used for LCA assessments right now also. So that A2 data, which is the main part of their, pro uh, of their emissions there, that of course we can use for A2 when we are ready for that. But we can see this can now still be used for A1 and they actually also added tracing impacts. So if somebody would want to calculate according to A2, it's possible. If they want to do it currently for any type of certification, they can because they have A1 data. And if they do projects in the US, they can actually also use the data. So we can also see that these values, they're not exactly the same because these are different type of methodologies. So even they use exactly the same quantities of data because those characterization factors are different, the characterization methods are different, the data ends up being quite different. So this EPD you can check later also, but all the EPDs in our software you can check and they usually have this type of, of format. So I'll close this one and I'll continue with my presentation. That is unfortunate, let me just skip through these. And we are here. So yeah, as I said, best way to find EPDs in our software would be to use those actual EPD numbers. I've also added two pictures of data cards here. So any data you try to find in our software, you can also find a data card for. And in the data card, there's a lot of information about the product itself, including, for example, the environmental profile, but also the EPD numbers. So those are the ones which are listed right here. So data cards will be handled tomorrow in the software training. So don't worry about not recognizing this yet. So then we have program operators. What are program operators? So a program operator is basically the publishing platform on which an EPD is made available. And a manufacturer can usually decide which EPD program they want to publish their EPD on. But in most cases, it would be a national one. So if we have a manufacturer who only makes products in Finland, they might decide to publish on the RTS EPD program. If we have a manufacturer who publishes their EPDs in Sweden, they might decide to publish on the international EPD system and so on and so on. But of course, manufacturers can decide themselves. They don't necessarily have to publish their EPD on the platform, which is, which is available readily in their country, but they can choose anybody. So if you want to find an overview of the different type of program operators we integrate the data from, you can go to our main website. And I also put the link right down there. So one click lca.com. If you hover over the software button, this one, and it will also tell you why one click LCA. And there we have the option to click on the 100 plus K construction data points, which is this link. In this link, you'll have an overview of all the different program operators or sources of databases we integrate data from. So quite easy to see if we, for example, are here, you could click on Europe and you can right away see what databases we are integrating, which is pretty much everything and which are relevant for, for you to use. You can also click this direct link and you will be brought to this page as well. So we make a promise on data which basically means that we integrate any publicly freely available qualifiable LCA data for construction. All the data we integrate is reviewed um, using our data quality process. If there is data which does not pass our requirements, it is possible that it's not integrated, but it's also possible we add it with a warning. 
And I'll show you an example of that tomorrow as well. We try to make sure that we always have the latest available version of every database we cover available in the software, which means that we update the database every week. I think last year, on average, we added about 350 new EPDs every week. And probably this year, this value is even higher. Most of the databases we update, we update, we either update every week or every other week, uh, which means that most of the time your data would already be there. If our customers have a certain license level, in this case business, they can also ask us to add new data sets. And if it's data, which is, for example, not published in the EPD uh, program operator, but it does meet quality requirements, we always try to make it available in one or two weeks. We also add data if there's, for example, an EPD with multiple products, which it covers, if there's a difference in the global warrant potential, which is reported. If you're an expert client, so that's our, our highest tier uh, level, you can actually also add your own data uh, to using your, your certification projects. But of course, this can also be unverified data. So if you use this for certification purpose, you're kind of responsible yourself to make sure that uh, this is correct. So we have different type of LCA data, which will be available to you. And what you could also check is this link, which I put here, how we work with data at one click LCA. It's a very comprehensive article, which basically summarizes everything I'm going to be talking about now. So on our platform, we have different type of market-based data and all this data we inspect using our data quality policy. The types of data we are integrating is different types of data you would be able to use for normal LCA assessments. So this could, first of all, be the public EPD data. So this is any EPDs which are published anywhere in the world under program operators, which have suitable construction sector data. The link that I shared earlier, uh, which had that overview of all those program operators is basically the same one as we see here. So you can check any of those. But we, of course, also have public LCA data. So this could be data which can be used for construction purposes. Um, but might not be used for uh, certification purposes. So in those cases, we have, for example, the ICE database from the United Kingdom, and we have the EPIC database uh, in Australia. We then also have our generic data. So these are data points which have been made by our data specialists and modeled with EquiVent, and we make them for key materials, which can be also localized. And localized is something which I'll talk about tomorrow, but it basically means that all the data can be adapted to represent local manufacturing conditions uh, regardless of where it's manufactured. So you would have a concrete, which you can simulate to be relevant for Finland, but also for Australia and also for the US, for example. We then also have process data, and this is generic RCA data for energy and processes. So that basically means that if you're trying to record the emissions for um, operational energy, there will be options for that. But the process data is also used to localize the generic data which will come to uh, tomorrow. There are also other types of data which is not really covered by our quality policy, um, but we can have them in the software. And those are these four types. So we can of course have private LCA data. So if you have a certain feature in our software, which our expert level clients have, they can add private data, which is not something we might necessarily have seen. So it could be that uh, a client is doing a project and they have received a carbon statement or a private EPD from a manufacturer, which the manufacturer wants them to use in their calculation, or they have specifically requested for it, but it's not something that is publicly available. So they can still use it in their, in their project, of course, but they are responsible themselves. Then there's also licensed LCA data. So this is more relevant for product LCA, where, for example, clients use echo event data to actually make their, their, their their uh, products. So this kind of data you have to normally pay for. So it's licensed to us that you could still use this. Equivalent data cannot be used directly for building LCA as I covered earlier also. There can also be mandatory data. So mandatory data kind of depends on the country and also the regulation which is there. So we can, for example, see the examples here. In the UK, we have impact. If you're doing specific Braham UK assessments, you have to do a calculation using impact data. In the Netherlands, we have the NMD database, which has to be reused for any calculation you do for the Dutch scheme there. 
And we have INEAS, which is used, if, for example, in France uh, for energy carbon or RE2020. Some new mandatory data, which was also added to this, is in Sweden, where we have the Bolverka database for climate declaration. And in Finland, we have the SUKA database for the uh, YM method we have to use. <clears throat> then we also have non-LCA data. So on our software, while this summer school is mostly talking about building LCA, we also, for example, have uh, CSR tools, so greenhouse gas reporting. There are also a lot of databases for those, like DEFRA, which I list here, or Bus Carbon, which has data on different type of uh, GSG protocol calculations. So not relevant for building LCA, but it's still data we integrate. So key requirements for quality and accuracy of LCA data. So data requirements according to EN means that all the data which is underlying, which is used to make DPD, has to be consistent, reproducible, and comparable. And it has to be checked for plausibility. So that basically means that if we're doing an LCA, um, the quality of an LCA will be better the different type of data we're using. So if we're having a really generic data set, let's say uh, a plastics EPD, which covers any plastic products for all of Europe, it exists. If we switch to a plastics EPD from one manufacturer in Europe or one manufacturer in a single country, it will be better. If we are switching from one manufacturer who produces 10 plastic products to one manufacturer who produces two plastic products, maybe in two different factories, this will already be better. But if we're then switching from this one manufacturer who uses or who produces two plastic products in two factories to one that only produces in one factory, it's even more accurate. So the higher or the accuracy of, of your LCA data, the better and, and the more accurate your assessment will basically be. There are some requirements according to the uh, UN Global Guidance and LCA Database Development, which are adopted in A2, uh, 15804 EN 15804A2 as well. That basically means that the geographical uh, representative of the data you're using uh, has to be very good. The technical representative of the data has to be very good. And it also has to be timely. So if we're doing an assessment on uh, a concrete wall, a precast concrete wall, which uh, I as a manufacturer am producing, I cannot use data from five years ago. It has to be relevant data because five years can be quite a bit different in, in how I was maybe producing my products. Um, the principles for the availability, uh, quality and consistency of LCA data in our software basically means that we try to have everything of it and in the same quality. Um, yeah. When we are talking about these different types of principles, it means also what I just mentioned earlier that we try to integrate all the data which is relevant for you to use in the software. And because of that, we also have the biggest EPD database in the world of, of any construction uh, software in the world. It of course has to be plausible. So we have a quite significant amount of checks we do on data, uh, which also has to meet certain standards like you know, 15978 which means that if certain materials do not pass our check, it might be disqualified, or it could mean that there, for example, is a warning in the software. So perhaps a product has reported on a lot of indicators, but is missing one. It could be reported with a warning, but if they're missing, let's say global warming potential, it would not be included. Data, of course, also has to be consistent. So if we have generic, uh, or if we have organic materials, which include biogenic carbon storage, We'll make sure that that is always separated uh, to ensure that all the data you have, regardless of who has recorded the EPD or which program operator has published it, that everything can be used. It of course has to be also representative. So we make sure the data looks good. You can find it in an easy way. And of course, we also want the data to be transparent. So the data cards we have in the software will always have a lot of information on who has made the data, if it's verified, what the environmental factors are, if there's a description, et cetera. And I'll talk about that also more tomorrow. We also have a data quality policy. So basically, how do we check the data we have to ensure it can be used? So the data policy we have designed uh, basically means that it has to be in line with certain standards. And it's 
aimed to make sure that we basically provide a high degree of plausibility and consistency um, because of course we don't have access maybe to all the information from the manufacturer we just have the EPD itself um, but this basically means that uh, we have a data quality results for individual data points if we do our checks so I'm not going to talk about all the checks we do but if there is data which is not relevant to the construction sector uh, we don't of course include it like sometimes if we integrate EPDs we might come across an EPD for pasta sauce like why would we include that to our EPD we are or why would we include that to the database it's not needed so it's filtered out if we have EPDs which are passing everything so like the EPD I showed you earlier it's a really well made EPD it's instantly available in our software if there's data but it might need a correction so maybe a manufacturer has an organic product but they haven't reported any, anything on the biogenic carbon, we might have to apply some changes to it and report the biogenic carbon separately. If there are untypical products, maybe very exotic products, uh, which could be easily like mistaken for something else, which looks like it, uh, we might have to enter it differently in the database with a mark that is untypical. So that if somebody is looking for like this artificial stone, that they might not accidentally take a different product. There could also be a possibility that we still enter data, but with a warning. So for example, that we have a product and we know of the hundreds of products which are similar, this one suddenly has only half of its emissions. Could be correct, but it could also be an issue in uh, the database from where we are sourcing this data from or a mistake in the EPD. Um, if that is the case, we could include it with a warning, uh, which just means it matches what we have integrated, but there could be some issue. But there can, of course, also be a possibility that we reject it. So if there is data missing in the EPD, for example, we have three examples uh, we see right up here, my bad. Um, if it misses certain values, for example, ODP, it could be rejected, blacklisted. If the A3 is, for example, missing, we could include it. Or if the data is not uh, scaled, it can also be excluded. If there's data which has been completely, uh, or if it's already expired, we don't include it either anymore. If we are entering data in the software, usually new EPDs, we get their valid for five years. And of course, if we have already entered it and it's in the software, it will stay there. But if it's a data point we are receiving after it has already expired, then usually we don't add it anymore because it will not be represented, uh, representative anymore for, for the product itself. So all the EPDs in the system have been verified. So in theory, because they're all meeting these same standards, they shouldn't need extra verification. But actual verification processes right now for EPDs, they can be quite different between different EPD program operators and different schemes. So we actually add an additional check in our software on the verification status. So basically, if you're trying to find different type of products and you want to make sure that they are verified according to what is stated, we also enter it, enter it there. So following up on that, there is kind of some issues in the EPD world right now that some EPDs claim that they are verified when they might be only internally verified. While the basic verification, which is a requirement, is actually independent verification. So if I'm making an EPD, I cannot just say, OK, another expert has looked at this and put a stamp on it and put it out there. I have to actually hire somebody else who's maybe not necessarily related to my company to check my calculations, to check my background data. And if everything still ma ma like matches after they have checked it, then I can say it's independently verified. And I would, of course, have to pay them also. So most of the EPDs uh, we have, they have to be comfort with the ISO 14025. So that means that there are certain principles and procedures we have to follow. This also includes that there has to be an independent verification of data. So LCA data, LCI data, and it has to be done for every EPD. And this standard also allows each EPD program operator to choose an EPD verification, but it has to be a third party or somebody who doesn't necessarily have links with the, uh, with the independence of the, which basically doesn't compromise the independence of the, the verifier. So if I'm doing this assessment, I would not be able to ask my colleague, but if a client is doing the assessment, they could ask us to do the verification. So then it's no conflict of interest, basically. So 
basically to add some more transparency to the marketplace, we have added some labels on the data cards. And actually in our new EPDs, there will also be a verification statement on the status of the verification. If there is no verification, this basically means that it's a self-declared EPD. It's very nice, but nobody can really check if the values you have there are accurate. If it's a software verified EPD, which is quite common in North America, the label which is added is machine verified. An example of this is, for example, you have the Climate Earth EPD program. Sometimes they might have a batch of EPDs. Let's say a manufacturer releases new EPDs and they do 500 at the same time. These are all machine verified. They might have small different variations, but basically too much work to manually check these. They can also be in-house verified. Some of the tools in Norway, which create EPDs, they are in-house verified and not third-party verified. And then of course, the most commonly third-party verified according to ISO 14025. So in most cases, uh, if you find an EPD, it will be third-party verified because it's, that's actually what it's called for. There can also be some other type of verifications, um, but those we're not really going to cover. The third party verified according to ISO 14025 is the most important one. And that's basically what we're always looking for in good quality data. If we have some data cards, I have given you three examples here from data you can actually find in our software. The middle EPD is the one we actually covered earlier. Under the data background information tab, you can also find the verification status. So we have this precast concrete EPD which has been made by one of our clients and this one was third party verified by our CEO. We have here a ready mix concrete, which is made by our data team, which is internally verified. And then we have here also a aluminum facade system from Germany, which is self-declared. So whoever has done this EPD has not bothered to go through third party verification. So this could have been a manufacturer specific one where a client has asked a manufacturer for a version of the EPD, which meets kind of their product requirements. Then there will now be a homework part again, and then I have some time for a Q&A. So the homework for this session is to basically check what kind of data is available you to locally or regionally. So you can go to our website and also check there um, in that, that EPD program operator, what kind of EPD programs are, are available for you, but all of the EPD programs which are available for you they usually have websites. And in these websites, you can usually search through them and check what kind of information is available. So try to check what you have there. So maybe locally would be better if you have a local EPD program operator, check what is available there, what kind of materials could you be using, what might be missing, and basically just, yeah, go through that. That will be the assignment for, for, uh, for this day. Then we now have some time for some q and I can see that there is already quite a lot of questions and I can see already 86 of them are answered live by my colleagues. So thank you very much for that. Um, we have here one question from Oliviera. After the estimated lifespan, is it necessary to recalculate the LCA to keep their certificate? Um, not really sure what you mean in this case. Uh, as a manufacturer, you can estimate the lifespan of the product. Uh, you can also enter this, but the lifespan that as a manufacturer you give to your product might be different from what it actually will be used for. So if I'm, for example, in a country where I'm producing, let's say in, in Norway, and I have my doors, if I actually use the same doors in Spain where it's much hotter, the lifespan might be different. Um, can you not see the Q&A presentation? Uh, is the Q&A presentation available? Can you guys see it? Anybody can let me know in the chat. Okay, that is unfortunate. Um, Hmm. Uh, 
I'm not really sure how I can make sure it shows everything. Okay, some people can see it and some can't. That's a bit weird. Um, I will just try to maybe call out which uh, things I'm going to see. Okay, yeah, not really sure what I can do about that, unfortunately. I'll check it for tomorrow and maybe I'll fix it in the next session. Um, Tanaya is asking what a grouped scenario means. Um, in this case, a grouped scenario would be for end of life where we have an option to report C1 to C4 all together. So instead of looking at different type of end of life scenarios like C1, C2, C3 and C4 separate, it can also be reported as one value. So that just depends on what kind of end of life process you've, been, uh, you've chosen. Um, Elena is asking if there will be any reused, no recycling, minimal amount of waste processing materials emerging in the end of life, are they also grouped to the C3 group? So if we have materials which are reused, technically they will not have an end of life process. They might be transported, so you have C3, but you might not have any C3 data or C4 data. So if we, and I'll show this tomorrow also in the software, but if you're actually uh, assigning the reused uh, end of life group, it will not have C3 or C4 days on the software. Um, if D is excluded from the scope, doesn't that encourage landfilling instead of recycling from a CO2 point of view? Yes and no. Um, D is usually uh, shown and of course, the benefits of then you, do, you might not have. The, the problem with D is kind of, if you have materials which are landfilled, C4 emissions are usually lower than C3 emissions. Uh, so yeah, it can be tricky. Like might encourage landfilling, but recycling can also be good from uh, an economic point of view, because you might actually get money back for the materials you're recycling. So it kind of depends. Um, Theo Pizzeri is asking, how do you calculate positive impacts? Are those values coming from a specific database? Positive impacts are basically just the benefits from materials. If you, in this case, mean, for example, the D-phase emissions. Um, Rosanna Oliveira asks, the stages where we consider replacement wouldn't delay the estimated demolition. Um, materials which are replaced will already be recycled throughout the life cycle of the building. So if, for example, at year 30, we are replacing wooden doors, those would already be replaced. Uh, so basically that means you have already have some end of life emissions in the, the B phase emissions. And I'll take a look at that uh, tomorrow. I'll, I'll discuss it tomorrow. Yeah, I'll set it back to the homework slide. I hope you can see it now. Um, what is the difference of global warming potential and acidification potential in the CML method? Both are in kilogram CO2 equivalent. Uh, they're not having the same uh, functional units. So they are recorded separately. Um, in CML, acidification potential calculated as kilogram. Okay, maybe I actually made a mistake in what I displayed there, um, but there are some differences in how it's uh, how it's recorded in the with the function units. Um, I would check actually our website where we have also that or the the help center. I mean, where we have the article on the different impact assessment methods, and there's a comprehensive overview there. Um, Bram asks, is in Tracy eutrophication potentials expressed as kilogram of nitrogen equivalent? Can this indicator be directly used in nitrogen emission calculators? And can these values be derived from the CML P of R values? Um, they are according to different uh, characterization methods. So I wouldn't use Tracy data in CML calculations. They will end up with 
they will end up being different basically. I can see there's a question from Henry in the chat that you haven't received the recording in the slides. Could you please send an email to our support team, which is support at oneclicklca.com and we'll get back to, uh, to, to you on that. Um, if you guys have questions, please put them in the Q&A section. I'm not constantly checking the chat. Um, we have a question from an anonymous attendee. Are the results produced by different assessment methods different for the same building? Yes, they are. So if you have one building where you have material quantities and you're doing it according to tracing and you're doing another according to CML, they will have different results. They might be slightly, they, they might be like similar, but they will not be the same because uh, yeah, the emissions are not calculated in the same way. Um, anonymous attendee question here, what is the difference between biogenic carbon and organic matter? Um, biogenic carbon is the biogenic content of organic products. Uh, so organic products we are using in calculations. Um, the article we have on biogenic carbon, I haven't completely covered that, but I would recommend to check that one. So if you are on our help center and you just search for biogenic carbon, that will explain all your questions about biogenic carbon. Um, Tassiana asks, if I upload a model with vegetation objects, are they considered in the negative calculation? How do I assign this as a parameter? Uh, yes, indeed. And thank you for sharing that, Samantha, but I think you might have shared it to only the hosts. Uh, I will share this to everybody. Okay, you did it. Thank you. Um, vegetation carbon are included in the B1 use phase. I'll show this tomorrow during the training as well, and they are indeed a negative uh, calculation. There's currently about 100 species you can choose there. Uh, so any type of data regarding vegetation objects will be uh, displayed in the biogenic carbon uh, column. So I'll show you tomorrow. Um, Abdullah asked if Luluk has an influence on the land where we are constructing the building and not the products. Is that right? Indeed, that is correct. Uh, Lenart is asking if there's any international regulation on how module D should be reported. Mm, not really. Um, there are some certification schemes which say you should include it and some which say you don't include it. Uh, so it's, it's kind of tricky. In most certifications right now that the majorly used one in both building and infrastructure, it's not included in the totals. Uh, we have a lot of clients who are, if they are doing a report for, for building SAR Infra, they basically provide two reports. So they have one or not two reports, two sets of results. So they have one set of results according to whatever certification you're, they're doing. So let's say a one, two, C4, and they might have one which actually includes then also uh, uh, D, D phase. And discussion on materials with biogenic carbon, it's a very hot topic in a lot of different countries right now, but in a sense, it only is a hot topic for let's say the next two years because if we switch actually to, uh, to A2, it will always be on the result page, but of course, certifications might actually start looking at this differently. Like uh, in the Netherlands, I am, I'm kind of involved in what we're talking about here, and they are going to try to see if we can include biogenic carbon in the calculations so that actually materials which are using more organic materials like CLT or wood, are, are rated more positively than, for example, a concrete or steel structure building. Um, then Mohammed says in EN 1504A2, the global warming potential biogenic is global warming potential minus the credit of biogenic. Um, not necessarily. Uh, biogenic only looks at basically the, the carbon store that we have right now. So in the EN15802, you have four categories for global warming potential. You have the total, which includes the fossil, the biogenic, and the land use and land use change. And the fossil is basically equivalent to the current global warming potential on A1. And land use change is completely separate from that. And then biogenic is also separate from that. 
Um, Tasiana asks is how can I include energy data? I'm currently using Insight and Green Building Studio. Can I upload Excel files? Yeah, easiest way would indeed to either do it through an Excel upload or to include it manually. So if you have energy data quantities in, in your, uh, your, your Excel or whatnot, you can just link them with an environmental profile from our database and use that in, the, uh, in our software. I'll cover that tomorrow, guys. Um, how can I use machine readable EPDs to enrich my model? Is it helpful to assign materials, please? I'm not 100% sure what you mean there, Tassiana, but if you have materials which have very clear material names, uh, our software can automatically recognize these names and it basically automatically links them to options that other users have made before, which I'll cover tomorrow. So it can speed up the process if you have very clear material names. It will also be actually discussed more in depth in session seven when we talk about the import. Uh, who verifies EPDs? People who have trained and have accreditation to verify EPDs, basically. Um, in our company, we have a couple of, of experts who can do it. But yeah, you can get accredited to verify EPDs. And Denise staff is asking, how can I get information about using your software? I'm also an EPD program operator. Um, you could reach out to one of our business developers. So basically, if you go to our website and you check on Get a Demo, you can find all the different business developers we have uh, for different countries, uh, which are relevant for specific markets. So if you find the market that you're working in, or operating in, uh, just contact that business developer and they will give you all the information you want. Um, can we compare different EPDs of the same product type? Absolutely. And I will talk about that tomorrow, how you can do that. We have very nice features for that. Uh, for how long are the records available? Um, at least throughout the session, uh, throughout the entire summer school. And you'll need them at least until the exam. Um, does Tazarin asks, what is the general functional unit used in EPDs? That completely depends on the product you're looking at. For example, if we have concrete, this is usually one cubic meter. If we have precast concrete, this might be 1,000 kilos. If we have insulation, this might be one square meter with a certain thickness. That so really depends. There are some product category rules which mandate that you have to use a certain functional unit, but it depends on, uh, on the different type of uh, products you're looking at. I'm not really sure what Ahmed means in A5 and also B1 to B7. It might be an answer to somebody else. I will just leave it for now. Um, who owns the data and how to safeguard it under copyright and other regulations when you make a deal with the clients? So basically, if a manufacturer has a data point which they publish on an EPD program operator, anybody can use the data. So if we have a Finnish client who publishes on the Finnish RTS scheme, anybody can use it. If a manufacturer, if you reach out to a manufacturer for a specific data, which is a, a carbon assessment or, or an EPD uh, project, project specific one for a product you're, you're purchasing, usually you are responsible for the copyright of this. So you might not have, you might not be able to, to share it. Um, Rosanna says, if an EP doesn't, doesn't include biogenic carbon data since it's not considered in the calculations of many certifications. Yeah, correct, that does happen. Uh, if it doesn't include it, it falls under one of those categories where we have to amend the data. So we don't change the original data we have, but we make an estimation on the biogenic con carbon content, which you can usually get from, from the EPD itself. Our data, our data team is very, uh, how to say, experienced with this process. So even though a manufacturer might not uh, include it, actually a lot of them do nowadays, but if they don't, we are still able to get an accurate estimation of this, depending of course on the material type and the type of organic material. 
Uh, Dana asks, would the questions and answers be available for everyone to be checked after the sessions? Uh, I don't think so. The questions that I'm answering right now, I can, of course, they will be in the recording. Um, I would say if you have more questions, uh, join the uh, LinkedIn user group and, and, and ask them there. And then you can probably discuss with other people who are uh, joining this summer school about them. Let me read this. Uh, when the outcomes after obtaining data from environment impact, is there any other assessment we can do? Or can we just justify the set number of our environmental impacts? So there are different types of rating schemes you can compare your building against. Like we have in our software, the Carbon Heroes rating scheme, which is uh, kind of our own, uh, which you can, uh, uh, you can compare your building to. Uh, but in, for example, in the, in the UK, they have just launched a rating scheme. I'm just lost for words on what the name is right now, but you can also compare the impacts of your building, for example, per square meter, what is there? Yeah, the LinkedIn user group, uh, user group was just linked in the uh, in the chat. Thank you, Samantha. Uh, Luciana, I'm not a, I'm not uh, familiar with this BAM 2020 initiative. Unfortunately. Um, if you want a more comprehensive answer on this, uh, can you reach out to our support team? We can get you an answer by email on that. An anonymous attendee asks, what type of verification is commonly required by national certification standards, for example, DGMB? So most of the certification, certifications which are there have assessors, and a DGMB also has assessors. So basically, if you as a consultant do a DGMB, uh, building LCA assignment, you have to submit this to a DGMB and they will check if it's correct. And if there are still some issues you have to change, they will communicate this to you and, and you basically have to update your assessment. This works the same in pretty much any certification in the world. Uh, Kanita asks, what if we cannot do the exam on the 13th? Can we do it later? Uh, please reach out to our support team for that. I haven't really thought about this yet, but we can sort something out. Uh, is a credit for recycling incorporated? Asked Asfant. There are some material related credits you can get, which also look at recycling. Um, if they are credits we support, it will be on the result page of the set certification we support. So for example, in the levels two, we don't have this, but there might be some which, which do look into this. For example, our, our uh, building circularity tool, if you're doing this for the GLA assessment, you can also get credits for, uh, for circularity. Uh, Chi Chen asks what form the exam will be in. Is it calculations, multiple choice or essay questions? It will be 40 multiple choice questions. So basically from the first eight sessions, that will be five questions from every session. So in total, we'll have 40. What can we do for calculating the impact assessment? Um, Kaihan, I'm not really sure what you mean. Could you elaborate on that? If you can just type a new question, I can answer it. Um, we have a question here regarding the survey of local EPDs in Mexico. There is not a regulation to define such compliance requirement, only voluntary compliance about ISO 14025 and 4040, how to build bridge to link to one-click LCA with local regulation to strengthen LCA assessment. In Latin America, that is a bit of an issue because LCA is not as popular. And for manufacturers, there's not really a push uh, to release EPDs for it. So it's really once a government starts to put more priority in sustainability, and specifically in sustainability relating to the construction sector, uh, there will, will probably be this kind of data. Um, best way would probably be to reach out to uh, local partners like uh, green building, uh, green building part partners or something like this. So Mexico GBC would be probably a good one 
to contact about this. But yeah, that is an issue in Latin America for sure. Um, as we are talking about sustainable buildings, is there any modules related to the reuse of water for irrigation, green walls, or flushing toilets, for example? Not at the moment. There are materials which you can use for green wall or green roof sy systems, but not really uh, these modules you're answering, Kaula. Um, anonymous question, how do we get ready for the exam? Is it possible to share a few sample questions? Um, I would say if you have attended the sessions or if at least if you have checked the recordings and you have done the homework, then you should be able to pass it, no problem. So don't forget that this summer school is basically intended so you can do building LCA assessments and carbon studies. It doesn't make you an absolute expert on anything in this field. The realm of construction industry is so big that it's not possible to learn everything in a three week uh, duration, even though I'm trying to teach you quite a lot. Um, did Dima ask, according to Timber, what would be the useful process for it be in the D phase module? Uh, usually energy recovery. So you incinerate it in C3 and you get energy recovery in D phase. So this could be used for anything really, heating of a building for production or whatnot. Uh, Gagan asked, if a material is recycled, isn't there a risk that it can be considered in both stage A and stage C and therefore may be over-reporting of CO2 emissions? Um, not really, because we have a methodology which accounts for uh, reused materials. Um, Samantha, would you be able to link the reused uh, checkbox article in the chat? So Gagan can check that. So. Probably it will appear in the chat in a second. Um, Shag Hayeg, hope I pronounce your name correctly. Uh, reuse, recycle, or recovery, or refurbishment in these level, level is like a process in circular economy. It is indeed. Um, in the circular economy tool, which I'll show tomorrow, uh, you'll have the different type of uh, uh, levels there, but I'll show it tomorrow. Um, Fab asked another question, with the enforcement of A2 and LCAA regulation, will the process of certifying climate neutral construction, timber construction, for example, be different? Many timber constructions are carbon neutral because of biogenic is accounted for in the final GHG database. It might be, we have no idea really yet. We just know that the EN 15804A2 is upcoming, but I'm not aware of any uh, current certifications who have actually already taken like concrete plans and saying, okay, and Brian, we're now going to be doing this differently or anything like this. So it, it very much depends. I think this will be a upcoming topic which will become really relevant in a couple of months because in theory in July, 2022, uh, A2 will become the new standard. Um, Mark August and, uh, asked, you mentioned LULUC land use and land use chains as part of the new A2 amendment. Is indirect land use included in LULUC or is it reported separately? I am not 100% sure. Um, I would recommend actually just check the A2 uh, rating and, and check specifically on this thing. I'm not 100% sure, sorry. Um, Afira asks, in which stages can we integrate on-site renewable energy systems? So if you have PV panels, for example, you would include the material emissions of these in the construction site uh, or in the building materials. So you would have basically the A1 to A3. Any energy which is generated with this, you would report in the energy consumption query, which I'll cover tomorrow. So basically any renewable energy which you generate, uh, that will be, well, I mean, you can use it for anything, but if you basically, use it to reduce the consumption of grid electricity. So you're buying less electricity. Uh, you would have just lower B6 emissions. But of course, renewable energy systems, if you have solar panels, they do generate material emissions. So don't forget about that. Uh, 
Um, David asked why, why we measure indirect impacts on global warming emission and don't measure the direct global environmental warming, the heat rejection from buildings, air, sea, and ground. Uh, I mean, you can measure that in energy modeling, but it's not really normally part of, uh, of this, of building LCA. And product LCA, they might sometimes include these emissions in the products, but you don't do it separately in building LCA. Um, Daniel asks, if from the LCA approach point of view, would it be correct to assume and or compare that an EPD is similar to a certificate of origin scheme? Yes, no, and why? How would these differentiate from each other? Certificate of origin schemes might not have environmental information, so they would not be the same necessarily. They might just state that, okay, this was harvested sustainably or whatnot. So quite a big difference there. Uh, is one click LCA compliant with Cove tool? I'm honestly not sure what Cove tool is, so I cannot tell you. Maybe one of the other people here knows. Uh, if you don't get an answer to that, just send us an email to support at oneclickLCA.com and we'll get back to you tomorrow. Um, Christina asks, can we access the EPD program operators without a license? Uh, usually you can. So if you just go to the website of one of these program operators, you can usually search through their entire database. You don't need to have a license for that because that kind of data is publicly available. So they want as much people to, as possible to have access to it. Um, Elaine says, is there any added credibility if a product has a patent and does verification help support a patent application? From an environmental point of view, not really. I mean, a patent is good for the company if they own the patent, uh, but it doesn't really add anything else. It just means that they have a really cool production process or anything like this, which other manufacturers might not have. I mean, this patent could help them produce even better products, but yeah, depends. Um, Marina says, given the extensive use of EPDs and environmental impacts, does LCA software offer comparable data from buildings or similar size location to our specific projects? So we have the Carbon Heroes program, which allows you to compare your building data with other types of building data, uh, like validated projects in our software, and I'll cover that tomorrow. Um, yeah, basically the question I just answered, this one. So Daniel elaborated on his question of the certificate of origin scheme. Um, let me just read it. I mean, it would have similar type of data, but it might not be according to the same standard. So I think it would be quite different from an EPD. So the, that kind of data we couldn't just use inside uh, an LCA calculation. Like if we need this for an LCA, it has to meet at least the ISO 1440, 14044, or the EN 15804 uh, uh, standards for the data. Um, as found asked, what is the level of processing you see? Basic processing or full recycling? This will be full recycling. Um, are dismountable or remountable elements part of the calculation of C1 or are they a different category? So technically no, because if you have accounted for uh, design for disassembly principles, any materials you would have, you can just dismount, for example, with screws or whatnot without damaging it. So technically there would not be any C1 emissions and they could be right away sent to recycling or anything like this. But it's not really something which is already a lot included in assessments. Um, Ashuman asks, high considering a case for zero building by balancing A1 to B7, 
And then, uh, is there a way to set different carbon emissions from the grid for a lifetime? Calculating, for example, for 60 years, but the grid emissions updating every 15 years. Um, not in a lot of different tools yet. In the GLA tool, you can set different type of uh, decarbonization scenarios based on the ones which are available to GLA. Um, you could do this kind of assessment, but you would kind of have to do it in different designs. Uh, so you would set different type of calculation periods for different designs. That would be a possibility. Um, Daria asks, could you please advise any sort of information to read more in detail about the various impact indicators? Um, probably the article we have on the impact indicators already provides most of the information you need to read for that. So if you're on the help center, just uh, search for uh, impact indicators. And if you have some other questions, just send us an email. I will help you further, of course. Not really sure what to answer to Ahmed his question. Um, if you can restate this, that would be great. Uh, let me read this anonymous question here. Um, so what if material construction is for buildings obtained from import trades? Um, if the data set is available in one cashier, should we find one by one details of the material composition by building construction? I mean, you can also account for uh, imported materials instead of uh, using only local data. But of course, you would have more transportation emissions in those cases. For some countries, it might be cheaper to import materials and build. But in a lot of cases, when you're trying to build sustainably, the only really feasible thing would be to uh, build or like uh, pr procure locally and build that way. But yeah, prefab construction is something which is becoming more of a trend also, but it's not that common yet. Um, anonymous question again, I'll just end, read this, give me one second. What is the framework of thinking to accumulate? Um, I mean, the, the, the way the data is in an EPD report is according to the standards, which is required. Um, negative notations could be benefits from the product. So that could be during the use phase, for example, or during the end of life processes. Uh, some values might be very small, that is possible, yeah. But of course, all the different impact indicators, they are not calculated the same way. So for example, ODP, the value would be very, very low. So usually they put it in scientific annotation, but if it's like in, in normal decimal numbers, it might be 0 0.000 per kilo or something like this. Um, Bob asks, if it is possible to check for certain components if they are certified according to certain standards, uh, for example, if a window component or wall is passive house certified, uh, not in EPDs. This is not something which is normally included in EPDs, so you would ha really have to check the manufacturer website, unfortunately. So in BRAM UK, you actually have a, a credit where you have to check for these kind of certifications, which is not data which a manufacturer puts in EPDs, unfortunately. It's usually only on their websites. Um, Dieter asks if there is a way that the question being asked is highlighted when it's being answered. It's difficult to find scrolling up and down. I'm not sure if it's possible. Usually when I answer them, I click that I would answer it live. I'm not sure if it puts it up or something. I'll try to see if I can answer it more, more clear. I was really hoping that it would show in my uh, recording, but it seems it doesn't really do that, sorry. Um, Jose asked, I got the program with the student license for tomorrow. What do I have to do up to update it or download another copy? I mean, our software is cloud-based, so you don't have to download anything. Even if you have a student license, you can just create a new project tomorrow and use the key that I will provide you tomorrow. Uh, so you don't have to have a new license for this or anything. So uh, this kind of answers or this kind of questions I'll answer tomorrow, so don't worry. Um, the last question we have there, is there a different value of embodied carbon in the methods of construction? 
This is software suitable for calculations of embodied carbon in the construction for offshore monopiles. Um, if you have certain precast elements which have different type of methods of construction that might already be included in the EPD, uh, otherwise you can of course use the different materials which are included there and just look at the material emissions and possibly enter then the uh, emissions for the manif for like the installation in the construction side operations query. That is possible. All righty, those were all the questions for today. The session went a bit over time today, but thank you all very much for joining. Um, I will make sure that the session will get, uh, how do you say, uh, converted and we'll send you a link again uh, tomorrow. I'll try to get the PowerPoint for uh, tomorrow's session also already available there. Like that's already done, so they should be able to put it there. So yeah, thank you very much for joining. Today was very theory heavy, but I hope you have learned some information which you'll be able to then link to actually using the software tomorrow. So thank you everybody for joining and thank you for my great moderators for, for joining as well.